Welcome to the Digital Planning Podcast. This series is designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. To keep up with all things digital, please subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. And now, Jennifer Ziegel, a partner at Kleinbart LLC, Ross Bruck, a principal of Estate Genie, and Justin Brown, a partner at Pepper Hamilton LLP, with today's topic. Welcome back to the Digital Planning Podcast. I'm your host, Jen, and I'm with my co-hosts, Ross and Justin, and this is the first episode of the second season of the Digital Planning Podcast, and we are extremely excited to have Pennsylvania Senator Tom Killian and Fred Cabell Jr. join us today. So Pennsylvania Senator Tom Killian has served the residents of the 9th Senatorial District since his special election in April of 2016. Senator Killian has prioritized protecting taxpayers, promoting economic development, and he is a chief sponsor of Senate Bill 320, which is an act to amend Title 20 of the Decedents Estates and Fiduciaries Code of the Pennsylvania Consolidated Statutes, which enacts a version of the revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act to provide uh, users uh, direction and agreements for the disclosure of digital assets and electronic communications uh, to allow fiduciaries to access those assets and have compliance and immunity for custodians of digital assets and other electronic communications. This bill was introduced into the Pennsylvania Senate Judiciary in uh, February of 2019. Now, our other guest, Fred Capel Jr., is the director of the Legislative Affairs for the Pennsylvania Bar Association. Fred has played an integral role in various stages of the introduction of SB 320, and he has also had direct involvement with negotiations from the prior iteration of the bill to its current version today. Thank you very much for joining us, Senator Killian and Fred. So uh, let's start with you, Fred, to kind of shape out how we've gotten to SB 320 and a little bit of the history of the Uniform Law Commission's initial version of UFADA, the Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act. Can you tell us a little bit about your role in shaping that law? Sure, and I don't want to say I shaped it because there's a lot of hands here involved, but I I can tell an intriguing tale, and I use the word intriguing very purposefully. In 2014, the Uniform Law Commission came up with, we'll use the shorthand, UFADA, the the Uniform Law, and uh, in 2015, they came up with the revised version. Now, if you know anything about the Uniform Law Commission, that's extremely extraordinary to have a version and then one year later have a new version. Um, PBA really wasn't uh, keeping abreast of that. We don't follow the uniform laws. But typically, nine out of ten times, if you see a uniform law pass in Pennsylvania, it's because the PBA has very much gotten behind it. So what happened was, in, in 2015, Senate Bill 518 was introduced, which was the uniform law, not the revised uniform law. And we took a quick look at it, and we didn't really think there was anything wrong with it. It was very much... Uh, as the Uniform Law Commission said, directed to remove the barriers to fiduciary access. Um, It kind of followed the rules that you would for non-digital assets. So our folks liked it, but at the time we weren't in a position to really put a lot of energy behind it. But uh, So that was introduced in February 2015. In October 2015, the bill was radically amended, and it was amended with the revised law. And the revised law did a very fundamental shift. The, the uniform law, the original, was focused on the fiduciary and making sure they got access. The revised was very much focused on the custodian, that is, the company that holds the information, and making sure that they were protected and how they gave it out. And one of the fundamental things that was different was, in many cases, to get that information, you would need a court order which, you know, most folks, even if they're not lawyers, know that, you know, writing a letter uh, is a lot less expensive than getting a court order. Um, So at that point, we were now very interested in in this legislation, um, and it had already been amended in the Senate, uh, so there wasn't much we could do about it in the Senate, but to be honest, we quickly went over to the House and said, we are not happy. This is not cool at all. Um, So what happened is the bill died. House Judiciary didn't take it up. But uh, 
Senator Killian, who, who can talk about this, he introduced it in, in the next session. And being a very good prime sponsor, he asked questions about who's for this, who's against it, etc. And he forced the stakeholders to get in a room and say, you know, work it out. We're not going to do anything until you folks work it out. And it was in those meetings where the PVA uh, was pretty much up against the technology companies. And I have to be honest with you, it was, it was quite intimidating because we were on conference calls with folks from Silicon Valley and, you know, Manhattan, et cetera. And, you know, here I am with a lawyer from Allentown, and we're just saying, look, this isn't good for people. <laughs> this is not fair. Uh, and that went on and on and on. Uh, and the argument of the tech companies, I want to be fair to them, was that you know federal law required that they get court orders and that they had to protect uh, the users. And we kept saying the users, from a legal perspective, don't exist anymore. For instance, when it's an estate, they're dead. <laughs> There's no privacy uh, interest anymore. Um, and we were kind of at a logjam. But what broke the logjam was a federal case came down out of Massachusetts, I believe it was, that said these federal laws don't apply to the situations that the tech companies thought they applied. And so then we were able to strike compromise. Um, and then after all that is when Senator Killian uh, introduced the bill. And that's why there haven't been any amendments or attempts to amend uh, since then. So going back to your negotiations with the, the tech companies, how long did that transpire? Oh, uh, I would say it was about six to eight months. Fred, how are, how are your negotiations with the tech company any different than some of the other states that were looking at similar legislation? Uh, you know, I don't know. What's amazing to me is, and I did a little research on this, is that uh, many states have already uh, adopted the revised law and without amendment. Um, so they just did it, and, and it's really, it's striking. If you look at, the, you know, from a lawyer's perspective, the uniform law, and then one year later the revised law, radically different approaches. And I'm surprised that other states didn't do what we did here in Pennsylvania, which was, you know, negotiate a compromise, because it really was all one-sided. And I give Senator Killian a lot of credit because, you know, he could have just introduced what was introduced in the past and said, hey, look, this is what it is, but... You know, I think he, he, he's very concerned about his constituents and, quite frankly, all the citizens of Pennsylvania and knows that for most families, you know, if you gotta get, you know, you're administering an estate and you got to go duke it out in court to get a court order, my goodness, there won't be any estate left at the end of the day. So I, I'm very grateful to him on behalf of the PBA, making sure that people in that room, that nothing was going to happen until they worked it out. So, Senator, I'm curious as to how this got on your radar screen. As Fred mentioned, uh, my predecessor, Do Senator Dominic Pelleggi, had the similar bill that he got out of the Senate. Well, not similar, it was an earlier version, and then, but it didn't get out of the House. Fred approached me as well, well as some other folks, about reintroducing it, and that's when I said, sure, but I want to make sure we're all in agreement. So that's what he mentioned to stakeholders meetings. I mean, we had the Uniform Law Commission Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Committee involved, the PA Bar Association's Real Property Probate and Trust Law Section involved, the PA Bankers involved, Joint uh, State Government Commission, Administrative Office of Pennsylvania Courts, and the tech companies. We had Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. And I said, let's get the language that we know we can move. And that's why we were able to get the bill out of the Senate and hopefully soon out of the House. If you had to guess, when do you think this legislation become, could become law? Well, that's <laughs> the legislative process is a tricky process, but it doesn't have any opposition because we did all our homework ahead of time. It's passed unanimously out of the uh, Committee of Jurisdiction, out of the Appropriations Committee, on the Senate floor. Not a single no vote. It is now over in the House uh, uh, Judiciary Committee. Um, we have a new chairman there, Rob Kaufman, who's a good friend of mine. I had served 13 years in the House. I served with Rob. I've already written Rob um, asking him to move the bill. Uh, when we go now, we're in, uh, when we go back after the new year in 2020, uh, I think we can't guarantee anything when it comes to the legislative process. But I'd be very, very surprised if we didn't have this thing across the finish line by the end of the spring. What do you think some of the hiccups were going from when you introduced it to now? Well, there really, other than getting everyone on the same page, there really weren't. I mean, as far as legislation moving, this thing moved pretty quick once we introduced the bill. I mean, we, we introduced it in February. It got out of the, uh, February of 2019. It got out of the Judiciary Committee in June of 19. That's pretty, that's pretty quick for the legislative process. 
out of approach uh, in October of 2019, and October, uh, the end of October of 2019, it passed the full Senate. So, other than all the things that went on before, going back to when Senator Pelleggi had it, all that, all that. But once we got the bill together and, and what, we had a product that everyone agreed on, it moved rather quickly through the Senate, and I'm anticipating the same in the House. You mentioned a lot of layers of support, of information that was provided to you, of, of um, reasons why this is a, a important bill and why it's an important subject to cover. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the information that you heard that might have resonated with you in terms of um, either factual information from the legal standpoint or individual stories of why this is so important? Yeah. You know, you, you come to Harrisburg with a certain, uh, you know, certain skill set. I'm not an attorney, so this wasn't in my, I was a stockbroker and my firm managed pensions funds. But once it was, the, the, the concept was brought to me, I never really thought about it. What happens when you die? I mean, I have tons of digital things, my kids' pictures, wedding pictures, music, writing, all kinds of things. I never ever give you any thought that, you know, that's a, the, the, you need a court order for my family, you know, for, for that to be passed on through through uh, either will or trust or, or whatever. Uh, so that was like an eye opener. And it's, it, you know, it's typical. It's the law catching up to where we are now. Uh, and this, and it's not rocket scientists. We're not the first state to do it. Uh, we're just a little behind the curve as far as, you know, a little bit, uh, behind other states. But we're going to get it done. And, and it's extremely important. I mean, m more and more of, of what we own is in the digital space. And uh, that, I, I was, uh, I, I probated my brother's will, my both parents' will, so I know what that process is like. And it's not, especially as a non-attorney, it's not an easy, not easy. Um, and they weren't even that all that complicated. Uh, now, because it was a while ago, I didn't have to worry about any digital assets. But I know my myself, you know, that that'll be an issue when I go, and I want to make sure my family's protected as well as everybody in Pennsylvania. One of the most important aspects of various versions of the revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act is is that the user, the, the decedent, the, the person has to specifically authorize their fiduciaries to access this information through estate planning documents or online tools or in other methodologies. And, and we've talked a lot about this in prior episodes of the Digital Planning Podcast. So I encourage any new listeners who want to learn more about the subject to go back to those episodes and check it out. So, Fred, could you tell us a little bit about what those negotiations look like? What were some of the things that you guys were discussing um, when you were negotiating the language of Rufata? Well, you know, i <laughs> I got to be honest. I don't remember a lot of the substance, but I do remember the, the general themes. And um, it, it was just mentioned with, with the revised law, um, well, let, let's go back to the original uh, bill, the uniform, or not bill, was never a bill, but the original version of uh, the digital assets le uh, proposed legislation. Um, if you had a will, for instance, um, and it didn't mention your online, uh, your digital assets, it was still presumed that, uh, you know, if you say I give everything to my wife, Holly, that... Uh, Polly would be able to look at my digital, you know, go to Facebook, you know, go to whoever and say, look, uh, I'm the minister of the estate. Uh, Fred gave me everything. You know, let me see the stuff. And <laughs> that's how it was. But when they switched it around, it was like, well, um, unless Fred said specifically in his will that Holly could access the Facebook uh, information, she can't. Unless she gets a court order. And so there was a bunch of different areas because, as you know, this covers various uh, uh, types of fiduciaries where, you know, we fought to change those things. And really the, the compromise came around more of we, meaning the, the Bar Association, we wanted sufficient information that we could gain without a court order to determine whether it made sense to get a court order. Is that pretty clear? In other words, you know, we don't have to know everything. We don't have to read all of Grandpa's emails in depth, but we should be able to ask, you know, uh, uh, are there emails that mention fidelity or something like that? And then if we get information back, then we could decide whether it's worthwhile to explore that further. Um, so that's what we were going for. Those are the general themes. You know, we didn't expect them to just roll over, but on the other hand, the idea that court order 
And, you know, let me tell you, it, it, like I said, it really was intimidating. It really was a David, David and Goliath uh, type situation. And there were some things that were said in it that were really strange. I remember one of the companies suggesting that um, not to worry about getting a court order because they would pledge that they would never show up in court <laughs> so that we would win by default. I'm not making this up. There's a lot of witnesses. And I'm just shaking my head. And, you know, I said to the fellow, I said, are, are you going to make that pledge for every technology company in the United States of America? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they thought we were just bumpkins or something, but these were the types of things we were hearing. So I guess they had their way with the law commissioners, got exactly what they want, didn't get pushback in any other state. And I give a lot of credit to the PBA's Real Property Probate and Trust Section because they looked at thing and it's like, nope, this is not good. You know, and the funny thing is, this is the PBA, and I'm not patting our own back, but it's just true, looking to save our clients money. Right? I mean, as lawyers, if we're going to litigate everything, well, lawyers are going to make a lot of money, right? We're saying, no, 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 no. That's bad because our clients, you know, our job is to do what's in our best interest to preserve their assets, not to fiddle them away through needless uh, uh, litigation. And I guess they weren't, I, I almost felt like the technology companies weren't expecting the level of pushback they were receiving. Um, but we were just, we felt very strongly about it and you know, I think at the end of the day, good legislators like Senator Killian, um, you know, yes, of course they want to hear what big companies have to say, and it's very important to our economy to make sure that those businesses have what they need. But the bottom line is going to be their constituents, the, you know, the people that are going to have to live with this law. And I think that was our ace in the hole, that they knew, okay, nothing's moving forward unless we work it out in this room. And I can't say that too much because it's really true. When, you, when, a, when a legislator creates that dynamic, it changes everything, you know. And um, previously, I, I really don't know what was going on with the previous versions of the bill because we really were kind of just, uh, you know, got smabbed out of the blue. It, it just, we weren't anticipating what happened, um, and it was too late to, to really, you know, talk to Senator Pelleggi about it, but like I said, we went, did go over to the House Judiciary Committee, and uh, we have a, a good relationship with the, the prior chair, and he, again, is like Senator Killian, the kind of guy that's like, okay, how's this going to impact the folks on the ground? <laughs> and we said, not very well, and explained to him, because it's not really hard concepts. The bill looks very complicated, but the concepts are pretty simple that underlie them. And that's, that's what made all the difference. I could sit there and be a pain in the neck because I knew Senator Killian had my back. If I didn't know that, I, my, you know, I could scream and jump up and down and wouldn't have made any difference. So one of the, the, the components of Rufata that I find to be incredibly interesting is the creation of online tools or a, a hierarchy for accessing digital assets with the, the most important part of that being, first, uh, online tools, right? So if a, just so to remind our viewers, if a, um, a custodian has a website and, there are, and an individual has um, assets at that website in some form, whether it's email or, or our pictures or documents or um, coins of some sort, monetary assets, the custodian can create an online tool and uh, that will allow the user to directly, um, for lack of a better word, designate who the person would be who would be able to access digital assets. So um, in, in a trust and estates world, it's been analogized to a payable on death kind of designation. Fred, do you remember any of the discussions over online tools with regard to Rufata or um, or what the tech companies, it, it, it seems as though the tech companies really pushed to have this aspect included in Rufata. Do you remember any any part of that discussion? Yeah, yeah a little bit, I, and, and, and they did, although I do, I thought that the tools, the way they wanted them, that there was negotiation over that. For instance, you know, a lot of times the tools that were available online, and I may still be, gave you like two, op you know, two options. Nobody can see this, anybody can see it, something like that. 
And the third way, I, I think, was part of the discussion. You know, what about sort of like on an insurance policy, listing, you know, who are the beneficiaries? Um, and you look, and I, again, I haven't, I don't do a lot of stuff online. I know I sound like a, you know, troglodyte or something, but, <laughs> but in the past, that was very much how it was. You know, nobody could see this, or anybody could see it, uh, and so there were a lot of discussions about making it that. And that way, I guess lawyers could advise their clients, hey, if you have these things, make sure you designate someone who can get this. Because think about it, if you do that, uh, then you don't have to go on the fishing expedition, and you certainly avoid the court order. So, um, yeah, the technology companies were very interested in that, and we weren't resistant to that because that's good practice. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how the online tools evolve. Uh, there are very few custodians right now who have online tools. I think Twitter just came out with one. Um, but it, it'll be interesting to see how that evolves, especially with, with hopefully Pennsylvania uh, passing Senate Bill 320. Well, they seem to be a little slow to it because I, I forget the number, but at least two or three dozen states have already adopted the, uh, the, the revised version. So, you know, there's the, the laws there saying they, that they should do that. Um, and then you have to worry about the smaller tech companies, and that's the other thing that would come up in the discussions was, okay, you know, you're the big companies, you're the Facebooks and the Apples, but there's a lot of small technology companies that might not be, how could I put it, as enlightened in faced with the law that, you know, you may be or you may say you, you will be. So that was another concern we had was, you know, we can't assume that it's all big tech companies. There's lots and lots of little tech companies uh, at, that are created every day and collapse every day that people are, are using social media sites, etc. So there was concern there because it was just the kind of the big players in the room, as you would expect, because these small companies, you know, they don't have lawyers and lobbyists all over the place. Uh, so that... We wanted to make sure this worked for everyone. You know, I think a lot of tech companies really aren't thinking about the transfer of assets, accounts, or electronic communications on the user's death when they're carving out and drafting their terms of service agreements. And to Justin's point on the hierarchy of access to digital assets in Mufada, you know, we have the online tool first, then estate planning documents, and then finally terms of service agreements. But oftentimes terms of service agreements could be completely silent as to those types of transfer provisions. Or may I add extremely restrictive. The, the term of service agreements really, I mean, they provided extremely high level of privacy protection. And because of federal law, that's the thing you can't forget about how federal law feeds into this. Because we didn't disagree at all with the technology companies with regard to what their requirements were under federal law and protecting this, uh, the, these assets, this data, et cetera. Well, yes. Well, the two federal laws uh, that are at play are the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and the Stored Communications Act. And most states, almost all of them, actually have uh, similar versions of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But uh, going back to your uh, experience in, in negotiating, you know, with the tech companies and helping uh, Senator Killian uh, propel this, this bill forward, have you come across any direct uh, stories that you've heard about a state administration's uh, gone awry when a fiduciary could not get access to a decedent's digital assets? Or, or Senator Killian, have you heard any direct stories? No, not, no I haven't. Have you, Fred? No, I haven't. And what was interesting is when we were going through this process, um, you know, my folks, I'll call them my folks, uh, you know, our real property probate and trust section, I mean, it's a position of the PBA, but the driver was our, our RPPT section. Um, they kind of felt like, hey, we prefer the status quo over a bad bill. <laughs> so we, that's why we didn't feel a desperate need to get something done if it was going to be a bad thing. Um, so, you know, we, we were kind of able to have a strong position in, in the negotiations because, like I said, I don't, it didn't, it wasn't a, what perceived as a, a, a big problem yet. Although I think folks thought it will definitely become a bigger and bigger problem. Senator Killian, I, I imagine that whenever positive legislation is passed, uh, there's a there's a desire to educate your constituents on these changes and, and update them and, and, and give them the resources so they can use the new legislation to their advantage. 
you might face a more of an uphill battle here with educating the public on this specific subject because not a lot of people know about it and and it's also a technical subject to try to explain any thoughts on that process and and talking with your constituents with all, all all the things we do we try to tell people what we're doing via our newsletters and and whatnot i i think for that with this bill though i mean the the, the best place to start is with, you know, like in Delaware County, Chester County, where I live, or the folks I represent, with the bar associations. Um, because where you're going to go when you have a question dealing with a, when you're, you're, you're probating a will or you're, you know, you're the executor after someone in your family passes, it, you're going to talk to your the family attorney or maybe the attorney that drafted the will or the trust. So I think it's very important that they understand it, which is what, you know, hopefully we're doing today. Um, and then, you know, we, we, we did get a, we got a fair amount of press on this bill uh, when, when we did it. Um, it's a, a couple editorials. I mean, I think they, the, the papers understood it, but it, it's like anything else. It's hard. There's a lot of noise out there. Just get the word out. But I think mainly through our bar associations. So now that you've introduced this legislation and pushed the the, this legislation is there any other digital asset legislation or um, emerging technology legislation that you see out there on the horizon nothing, nothing right now but things change so rapidly you just have no idea what's going to go and I, you know and I would look to uh, you know I'm always looking for ways to make things better for the folks that I represent uh, so if something came down a road that, that we needed legislation, I'd be more than happy to introduce it. You know, I've, got a, I've got a lot of other things that I'm working on outside of this space, obviously. And, you know, a lot of it comes from you know, lobbyists have a bad you know, connotation, you know, you have lobbyists. But a lot of the ideas we look that come to us come through lobbyists, either a paid lobbyist for like, like Fred with the uh, Bar Association, or I call them citizen lobbyists. If someone walking into my district office that's upset about something, and you know, it's the old story, there ought to be a law, right? Well, uh, that's where a lot of the good ideas, uh, a lot of the good ideas come from. Uh, you know, not a, very few of us have original ideas, uh, <laughs> frankly. I mean, people come to us with concerns about about whatever issues and sometimes you can fix them legislatively, sometimes you can't. So along those lines, if people have questions uh, how do, or que questions about the legislative process or questions about Rufata, how can they get in touch with you? How can they get in touch with Fred? Well, for, for me, you can just go to my, my website, centerkillion.com, and, and if you want to follow legislation, the caucus, just type in uh, Republican Senate Caucus, or the Democrat Senate Caucus, they both have great websites where you can track legislation, all uh, and, and where it is, what committees it's in, how it's moving. Um, there's lots of resources. Fred, how can people get in touch with you? Sure, they could, they could email me. Uh, my email address is Fred dot Cabell, C A B as in boy, E L L, at PABar.org. Um, uh, I would caution them, though, I don't give legal advice. <laughs> Just happy to tell them what's going on legislatively. Well, um, thank you to Fred. Thank you to Senator Killian. Um, we really appreciate both of you being here and um, helping us learn a little bit more about. Uh, Senate Bill 320 and Pennsylvania's Revised Uniform Fiduciary Access to Digital Assets Act. The mouthful. mouthful. Um, but thank you for being here. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Digital Planning Podcast. The podcast designed to educate individuals about all things digital in connection with estate planning, business planning, and estate administration. Please subscribe to this podcast and leave us a rating or review at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you download your podcasts. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.